Hi there. My name is Laurent Belco, and I'm a research scientist at Unity Technologies. And in this video, I will present the solution we developed to bring accurate Fresnel reflectance to real-time game engines. This is the joint work with Megan Batty from EOGS and Pascal Bala from Inria. One of our goals is the convergence between real-time and offline rendering. In this context, we aim to allow real-time rendering engines such as Unity to be used more in productions that would traditionally use offline rendering software. Our goal is to push the use of game engines in all the different stages of the production pipeline, not restricting its use to pre-visualization or background rendering. However, this poses many challenges. One of them being that the asset workflow must match. Once an artist has authored an asset in a content creation tool, it should be interpreted the same way in both the offline and the real-time worlds. In this talk, I will focus on appearance. To achieve the same appearance, the PBR material model should match, or at least resemble each other closely. While the industry standard has converged to the use of microfacet theory to unify surface shading, there is still an issue with the match of one of its components, which is the Fresnel reflectance. But what is Fresnel reflectance? Fresnel reflectance describes the amount of light that is reflected by a planar surface. It is one of the basic components of microfacet theory and is characterized by the index of refraction, which is a complex quantity. Its real part is called eta and its imaginary part kappa. It is in a microfacet model, lights interact with a surface as if it were composed of tiny mirrors that are randomly oriented. When light reflects off one of those mirrors at a given angle, here, theta, its energy is reduced by a factor that is shown on the curve on the right. This curve is called the Fresnel reflectance. Now, a problem resides in the fact that editing a complex index for a fraction is not artist friendly. Fortunately, we can avoid its use by using Oligrid's Branson's parameterization instead. This parameterization exposes two quantities, the reflectance at normal incidence, that we call the reflectivity, R, and the tint at grazing angles, that is called the edge tint. Both two parameters can be converted to eta and kappa to evaluate the Fresnel reflectance. For example, changing R shifts to higher or lower reflectances, while G impacts the grazing angle component. While this is already much simpler to use than plain eta and kappa, it still has some issue, which Nati already discussed in the previous talk. In this talk, I will concentrate on the major one, in my opinion, which is linearity. Here is an example of linearly interpolating between two edge tint values, one that is purely blue to one that is purely red. You would expect that the in-between color here would be purple, but instead the edge tint disappears. The overview of Fresnel reflectance wouldn't be complete without mentioning Schlick's approximation of Fresnel reflectance. This was introduced in 94 by Christoph Schlick for performances reasons. Schlick Fresnel exposes the reflectivity parameter and uses it to lerp between a constant and the power of cosine functions. Because of this restriction, we have no control over the grazing angle as shown on the right. Now, the coexistence of both Schlick's and Goldbranson's methods creates another problem in my opinion. Why so? Because it creates multiple standards. For example, companies such as Autodesk expose Goldbranson's parameterization in their Uber shader, while Disney's principal BRDF model uses Schlick. You can even have combinations of both methods. There isn't a consensus to use one or the other within the graphics community. My take on this is a little bit different. I don't think it is up to me to decide for the artist which model is better. If they want to use the edge tint, they should have tools and renderers that support it. My problem though lies in two facts. First, those two models are not compatible. Schlick Fresnel does not represent a valid Fresnel reflectance. Hence, for a given reflectivity, there is no edge tint G that will produce the same curve as Schlick Fresnel, as you can see on the right, converting to one or the other change the appearance. Second, game engines such as Unity are restricted to use Schlick Fresnel, which restrict their use in film or TV production, and in this talk, I will show how we can change that. Maybe so far you're not sure why we can't have edge tint in real-time engines. I mean, we have the formulas, we only need to evaluate them, right? Well, the issue is that modern game engines use pre-computed integrals to efficiently evaluate shading, Say you want to evaluate light reflected off these objects towards the camera. The rendering equation tells us how to evaluate this quantity, but it requires an integral that has no analytical form and too many degrees of freedom to be stored. It is just too costly. 
As Brian Karras described in the PBS course of 2013, we want to decouple this integral and use an approximation, where the contribution of the light is separated from the contribution of the Fresnel reflectance. Both integrals can be pre-computed and stored for efficient shading. The issue still is that the integral of both the Fresnel term is four-dimensional, as it depends on both the roughness, the view direction, and the Fresnel parameter. Storing and using such a table is out of the question. So instead, we use Schlick Fresnel. It has two advantages. First, it reduces the number of parameters to three, but since it is a linear decomposition based on the reflectivity, it, we can factor this parameter out of the integral and store 2D texture that are easily fetched on the GPU. Let's summarize. What are the requirements of a Fresnel model that works across production pipelines? First, we would like this model to be accurate so as to get close match between the real-time and the offline use. Second, we would like this model to be compatible with real-time constraints of the split-sum integral. Third, we would like these parameters to be as linear as possible so as to avoid incorrect blending I showed previously. Last, we might want to have an optional edge tint that is a default configuration where the material behaves similar to Schlick but following a real frontal reflectance. As mentioned, Schlick Fresnel fulfills real-time constraints and has linearity, but it fails to be accurate and does not enable us to control the grazing angles. Goodbranson's parameterization, on the other hand, uses exact Fresnel formula, so it is accurate and provides an edge tint parameter to control the grazing angles. However, it fails to meet the linearity and the real-time requirements. In this talk, I'm going to build a model that fulfills those criteria. But what I'm going to present is not just a model, but rather a framework to build and rectify any Fresnel model you would like, sort of the Swiss knife for building Fresnel models that work across industries. Remember that real-time renderers pre-compute the Fresnel reflectance. The insight behind our new model lies in pre-computation. What does that mean? Because the Fresnel reflectance is tabulated and stored in the texture, why should we care? about an integral form such as the complex Fresnel function or Schlick's approximation. The only constraint we have to care about is that this table stores a decomposition of Fresnel reflectance that we can wait to reproduce Fresnel curves. And this is the key idea behind this project. How do we build such a decomposition? We will use data. By extracting a basis from a set of Fresnel reflectances, we can build an approximate model that fulfills the split sum integral constraints. One caveat is that we don't know how many elements are required. Fortunately, by analyzing reflectances, we found that with three basis elements, we could very accurately reproduce a wide variety of reflectances. In our prototype, we used four basis elements to match RGBA textures. To extract the basic function, we used the SVD in two steps, with some constraint. I won't go into details here, but you can find a Jupyter notebook in our supplemental material that goes through the whole process. Here we can fit the Fresnel decomposition to the Fresnel data that we want to reproduce and have a tailored model. Here are the four basis elements we extracted from a set of g equals 0 and g equals 1 data points. As you can see, the first two elements will control the brightness of the curves, much like Schick Fresnel, while the last two elements affect grazing angles and will enable us to reconstruct edge tint. Even if I'm skipping some details, I would like to give you an intuition about some of the parameters. Say I want to represent this curve. What I need to find is four coefficients, C0, C1, C2, and C3, that will be used to blend the different basis function. But because we are constraining the first basis function to be the constant and the second to start at 0 and end at 1, then C0 and C1 are respectively the reflectivity and 1 minus the reflectivity. Here is a comparison between the ground truth Fresnel and all the composition for different eta and kappa. And as you can see, all the composition can faithfully reproduce the Fresnel reflectance. And now if we compare with Schlick, we can see that it fails to correctly reproduce all the grazing components. Here are some rendering comparisons using measured index of refraction. First, we have rhodium. Please concentrate on the edge of the object here. As it is at grazing angles that the most striking difference will appear. Here is a comparison between Schlick and a reference. 
And as you can see, Schlick overestimates the grazing angle component, making a brighter look, while our model fools the reference. Here is another comparison for tungsten. And now for chromium. And again, Schlick Fresnel don't, don't reproduce the, the grazing angle components and overestimate the reflectivity, while our model follows the same criteria. Okay, so far we have a real-time compatible and accurate model for Fresnel. Still, two things are missing though. We do not have a completely linear parameterization and we still need to find a default no etched in behavior. Let's focus on the linear parameterization first. We could build a parameterization based on a color, similar to the extended lasagna that Nati already presented. And for that, we only need to look for the zero crossing of the last basis element, which is here at roughly 78 degrees. At this specific point, for given reflectivity, the Fresnel reflectance is solely determined by the C2 parameter, which makes F78 a valid parameterization. I won't go into details of this parameterization here, because Natty already talked about this idea in the previous part of the course, and since it is equivalent to the extended Lazani parameterization, it will share its drawbacks. It requires care to avoid breaking the energy conservation, but it also introduces unwanted colors such as the bluish tint here at the grazing angle when the user specified a gray grazing color. So instead, I will show you how we can rectify the nonlinearity of Gulbrandsen's parameterization. And for that, we are going to use the space of coefficient as a way to ensure this linearity. Remember that the coefficient behaves linearly, so any nonlinearity in the parameters will show in the space of coefficients. Here on the right is the coefficient space with C0, the x-axis, and C2, the y-axis. What I can do in this space is to displace Gulbrandsen's parameterization. To do so, I transform a regular grid over coefficient space. Each point corresponds to the first and the third coefficient when fitting a reflectivity etched in pair. We can see that dots are not spaced regularly along the y-axis, meaning that there is a non-linearity. We can also see that all of Fresnel reflectance might by the parameterization are enclosed in a wave shape. And this particular point will allow us to develop on your parameterization. We are going to first linearize with respect to the C2 coefficient and retrieve the remaining coefficients C3 afterwards. Let's have a look at how we can build this. First, we notice that this wave space is enclosed by two curves corresponding to g equals 0 here in red and g equals 1 in black. This means that for a given reflectivity, all the Fresnel curves that share this reflectivity are comprised in the light between two points on g equals 0 and g equals 1. So when we parameterize the edge tint, we do that by interpolating a new parameter that simply blends between the g equals 0 and g equals 1 uh, curve, and we call that parameter beta. And by constructing the grid with this new parameter, we obtain our new parameterization. As you can see from best renderings, the new beta parameterization is much more linear, but what is particularly interesting is that it spans the same space of Fresnel reflectances as the old G parameter. To measure performances, we also built a small OpenGL demo that implements the split sum integral of Paris in image-based lighting. We found a maximum overhead of roughly 0.02 milliseconds there for a 720p resolution. And here is a benchmark running live. First, we change from Schlick to all parameterization to see the increase in performance. And now we'll see how getting um, a purely smooth surface affects the performances. Thomas Delio, a research engineer, implemented this solution in the Unity engine. Here is a demo showing the editing of the edge tint for the robot asset on the right. First, the user is going to change the metal part of the robot and putting a red edge tint. And then for the red part of the robot, putting a bluish, a greenish edge tint. Okay, 
The last point we have to cover is how to provide a reasonable default parameter if one doesn't need HTint. We found that there are practically as many potential ways to obtain a default parameter for the HTint as you can think of. Of course, setting beta is to zero is a bad idea. It might be good for low reflectivity here, but as soon as you get to high reflectivity, you get this kind of grazing angle component, a very strong one. At some point, we experimented with the idea of looking for the beta parameter that minimizes the impact of the belly. Uh, while this worked well, uh, I think it has a practical drawback if you want to include etched in control in the model. The issue is that the default beta parameter is now dependent on the reflectivity. For example, let's say that an artist wants to paint a reflectivity map and later added the edge tint with the default value as the base color. If later uh, they want to edit the reflectivity, they might introduce an edge tint in the region that we are not intended to have one. So instead, we settled for beta equals 0.75 since it provides a more friendly behavior as you can see here. There is no grazing angle appearing on the curve of these parameters, and the, because it's a constant, it would prevent the issue of the edge tint leaking during editing. Here are some res rendering using the new beta uh, parameter for different reflectivity, and it comparison with uh, the equivalent schlick for the same reflectivity. And as you can notice, there are some difference, notably in this region of low reflectivity, but overall, it's roughly the same. Before concluding, I would like to start a discussion on whole use of Fresnel and how we could look in the future and avoid the pitfalls of mixing Schlick and the analytical Fresnel I described in the beginning. It is quite unfortunate that during to same, the recent events, we cannot have this discussion in one room, but that doesn't mean we can't still have it. What follows is a brain dump and should not be considered a set of guidelines, but more as a catalyst for a discussion. My first point is that mixing models with non-overlapping default is a bad idea. Now, we could build an extended sheet model as uh, Natty pointed, uh, but a possibility could be to replace Schlick entirely from our pipeline and use a no h default in place. I mean, we shouldn't be tied to the exact formula of Schlick Fresnel, but rather aim for Fresnel that offers a range of dielectric and conductors over a unique reflectivity range. In that sense, we could even build a specific model using the decomposition method. More importantly, I think this would allow user and artists to choose if they are fine with a model that has no edge tint and provide it in an opt-in, opt-out way. There, there's the issue of the parameterization if we want to include grazing angle control in the model, since the edge tint parameterization and the artistic color parameterization can both produce unwanted color issues. Maybe a not so strict definition of the grazing angle that is the edge tint is fine. Or maybe there is a parameterization out there that is still to be discovered and that will solve all our issues. But in the end, maybe this is a choice that only affects the production of assets and not use in rendering. Because maybe what we could use is another format that is used to exchange assets between engines in a principled way. There are as many form that this format could take, as long as it enable to accurately reproduce the desired reflectivity curves. But we still have to remember that any operation on this exchange format should be well defined. And that concludes my talks. Uh, if you're interested to try out this new framework, there's a Jupyter notebook as well as source code available on my website. Um, that's it for me. I thank you for your attention and I thank all the people that made this possible.